All right, welcome to our very first episode in our Biology 1 ECA review series. And this one's on the first standard, which is called cellular chemistry. Now, the core standard number one from this standard deals with what are the biomolecules and what do they do? Well, the biomolecules, if you can remember, are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And carbohydrates are made out of only three atoms, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and typically found in a ratio of one to two to one, carbons, hydrogens, to oxygen. Typically two hydrogens for every oxygen. That's where the hydrate word comes from. Now, there's three main functions for carbohydrates. Number one, they are the main energy source, especially monosaccharides such as glucose you see over here in this picture. Um, think of a lot of our monosaccharides as having this hexagon shape, especially glucose. That's one way that we like to keep it. The second one would be energy storage, and this would be by polysaccharides such as starch and glycogen. And then the third function would be structural support, uh, cellulose that you find in plant cell walls, and the chitin, which you'll find in the exoskeleton of insects. Lipids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, same as carbohydrates, but it's not in a one to two to one ratio. You'll often have a lot of hydrogens compared to the carbons and the oxygens. All right. Now they've got four functions. Number one, energy storage. This is typically above your fats and your oils. They can be chemical messengers. And remember, chemical messengers are called hormones. Um, they do make up the primary component of cell membranes, which you see over in this picture here. This is a phospholipid where they have their polar heads and their nonpolar tails. And we'll talk more about that on another slide. And then finally, uh, some organisms like leaves on plants and uh, some insects will have waxes which work as a waterproof covering. Now proteins are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, um, and sulfur. And they have seven functions called escape time and we're going to cover that uh, later. But as you can see in this picture here, this is the uh, primary structure of an amino acid and we're going to revisit that in a little bit. And then the fourth type are uh, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And they pretty much serve two functions. Number one, DNA, which can be the genetic code, is how uh, information is inherited from parent to offspring. And then when you use DNA with its sister RNA, that's used in the process of um, protein synthesis. So you look over here in this picture in the lower right hand corner, on the left you're going to see the single stranded RNA and on the right you're going to see the double stranded DNA. Now standard B1.1 deals with what is the structure of these four different um, um, biomolecules. Now carbohydrates, remember they're made up of CH and O in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, they're made out of a single part called a monomer. And in the case of a carbohydrate, the monomer is called a monosaccharide, and that word means single sugar. Now, if you start hooking your um, monosaccharides together in a process called dehydration synthesis, you're going to create polymers, um, which are called polysaccharides. So if you look over here in this picture over here to the right, you see um, a single monosaccharide at the top, and then towards the bottom, you're going to see a polysaccharide. Now lipids don't really have a real monomer, but their parts are still connected and broken apart using dehydration synthesis and um, uh, hydrolysis, which is the opposite of that. Now proteins, remember, made up of C, H, O, N, and S, and these guys, their monomer is called an amino acid, and they can put two amino acids together, that'll form a dipeptide, and if you put a bunch of amino acids together, you have a polypeptide. So if you look over here in this picture, you're going to see an alpha carbon in the middle, you're going to see an amino group to the left, and you're going to see a carboxyl group to the right, and you're going to use those functional groups to hook together. And as you see here in this dimer, you have a peptide bond that joins it together. Uh, nucleic acids, the building block of a nucleic acid is called a nucleotide, and they're also going to have three parts. You're going to have a five carbon sugar or a pento sugar found in the middle, and you're going to have off of carbon number five, you're going to have a phosphate group, and off of carbon number one, you're going to have a nitrogenous base sticking off of here. A nitrogenous base means it has nitrogen inside of it. And remember, depending on what kind of amino or nucleotide that you have, the base is either going to be adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine in um, DNA, 
and take away the T and then replace it with uracil if you're going to have RNA. All right. Core standard number two looks at how the shape of a biomolecule determines its function. And there's nothing more important than when it comes to proteins because their shape follows their function. All right. Now, protein structure has four levels. You have a primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Primary is the most important because it's going to be the amino acid sequence. And the sequence of amino acids is going to determine what happens in the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary level. Secondary level, you're going to create uh, folds, and you're going to pl create pleats, as you can see down here in the picture below. And then tertiary, you're going to take your secondary structure, and you're going to wad it up together. And then finally, when it comes to quaternary, you're going to add another polypeptide, and you're going to have what's called a globular protein. And you can see all that here in this picture down below. Now, the functions of a protein. And we use this uh, mnemonic device called escape time, where E stands for an energy source, only if carbohydrates and lipids have been used up. Two, or make a number, uh, the S would be the structural component, which would be like your cytoskeleton, microfilaments, microtubules. The C stands for communication. These would be your chemical messengers, which would be your hormones. T for transport. Uh, certain molecules or protein molecules like hemoglobin will carry stuff. Hemoglobin carries oxygen. Uh, I for immunity. Your antibodies are going to help uh, fend off disease. Movement. Your muscles are made up of protein fibers, specifically actin and myosin, and they help your muscles contract. And then finally, the most important function of any biomolecule, and especially a protein, is an enzyme because enzymes control the rate of chemical reactions, and everything occurs in your body through uh, chemistry. All right, now standard B1.2 deals with how different cellular processes can be controlled by enzymes. Now when it comes to enzymes, we got to think of the lock and key model. And I'm going to zoom in here on this picture because an enzyme has basically one main part on it. And that shape of that part determines what it can do. And that's called the active site. Now the active site is where the substrate's going to fit. And the substrate is what the enzyme is going to work upon. So think of the active site as where the work's going to happen on the enzyme. And the substrate is the molecule which is going to be worked upon. So in this picture here, you see a hydraulic reaction where or hydrolytic reaction where a dimer, a two-part molecule, is broken into the one part. Okay, Phospholipids are a type of lipid that is the primary component of a cell membrane. And as you can see in this picture here, they have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tails. And what this will do is it'll make sure that the heads are to the outside of the membrane and the tails stay to the inside, and that creates that phospholipid bilayer of which all cell membranes are made out of. And then in nucleic acids, they have a certain structure. For example, RNA is single-stranded, DNA is double-stranded. So over here on this double-stranded DNA, as you can see, it has a sugar phosphate backbone with the uh, bases to the inside that are held together by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are strong enough to hold it together, but they're also easy to unzip so that you can do replication and transcription. All right, standard B1.3 basically deals how the environment within and outside the cell can regulate how these molecules do their job. And for example, with proteins, their shape is really, really important. So things that can change their shape can make the protein work or not work. And the main things that can change a protein shape, and remember that change in shape is called denature. The number one things that can change the shape of a protein are an increase or decrease in temperature, specifically increasing the temperature, which will make the, the protein fall apart, or rapid changes in pH, either going up or going down, can also do the same thing. So obviously, if you change the shape of the protein, you're going to alter its function. Now, when it comes to controlling enzymes, there's some different ways that you can turn them on. You can turn them off. A change in pH, which would cause it to denature, well, maybe that change in shape actually turns it on, or it also could be a way that you could turn it off. So enzymes that work in your stomach, which has a very low pH, will not work in the uh, small intestine, which has a higher pH. Um, now, change in the concentration of the substrate will also influence how much the enzyme works, because if there's a lot of enzyme but not much substrate, not a lot's going to happen. And just the vice versa, if you have a lot of substrate but low amounts of enzyme, 
speed of that reaction is not going to be very fast. Okay. Now, also a great way to control enzyme is through by using inhibitors. And there's two types of inhibitors. There's competitive, which is a molecule that competes for the active site, and there's allosteric, which means non-competitive. So I'm going to zoom in here on this picture. Okay. Now, as you can see on the left, you have competitive inhibition. You have another molecule that is clogging up the active site so the substrate can't fit. That effectively turns off that uh, enzyme. Now, if you can remove the inhibitor, you've turned the enzyme on, and now you're off and running. Allosteric inhibition works kind of the same way, but you're not using the active site. You're using another site conveniently called an allosteric site. So if you stick the inhibitor inside the allosteric site, that changes the shape of the active site, then the substrate will not fit. Now, you pull out the allosteric inhibitor, in, or the active site goes back to its regular shape. Voila, enzyme turned on it starts to work, okay? All right, that's our final slide in this episode. So don't hesitate to review this one again as you get closer to the ECA because you should find it helpful, okay? Until our next episode in this series, we're going to catch you on that flip side.